From Detroit, Michigan, I'm Laura Bonnell. I have two daughters with cystic fibrosis. From Ontario, Canada, I'm Beth Vanstone, and I have a daughter, Maddie, with cystic fibrosis. And I'm Patty Tweed of Manitoba, Canada. My son, Devin, has CF. Regardless of the country, CF moms can relate and support one another. This is our Moms to Moms podcast from Canada to the United States. Love we have is all we're fighting for. So it's the three of us again, which is great to be back. It's been a while since our last podcast, but we have a great woman that we're talking to about her experience with cystic fibrosis. Welcome again, Patty and Beth. Great to see you. Good to see you too. Good to see you. It's been a while. It has been a while. Well, we're just going to kick this off uh, right now uh, and we will let everyone meet Lorna McEwen. And, you know, there is a lot of trauma that goes with a chronic illness like cystic fibrosis. And as CF moms, we are very aware of this. And so are patients like Lorna McEwen. She is 61 years old. And when she was born in 1960, she had a bowel obstruction. She had surgery and was sent home by doctors. And they basically told her parents that they were sending her home to die. Now, Lorna had two brothers with CF. One died at two weeks old. And when Timothy was born in 1965, Lorna was five years old, and that's when her parents and the doctors determined that three of their six children had cystic fibrosis. Timothy died when he was 19 years old, and Lorna lost her 24-year-old son as well to cystic fibrosis, and Lorna has been married to her second husband for 25 years. And I can't imagine how hard it would be to move forward after losing a sibling, but two siblings and a son. Thanks for joining us, Lorna. And please tell us how you can mentally keep going after this loss and knowing this disease so intimately. Thanks for having me, guys. I guess a big push for me was I grew up in a home where I was raised with a positive attitude, raised with the fact that stuff happens. Each of us has a purpose in life. I think when stuff like losing the one brother I didn't know, Tim and I were very close and I felt really guilty when he died because I couldn't do anything. But I think it was one of the turning points where I decided, well, I couldn't do anything to help him. Maybe I can do something to help somebody else with Sia. As I became an adult, I realized that there's other things you can be doing to encourage them, right? And I always try to look for the positive, not the negative. Even though the negative is there, I try to, you know, look for the good things. Uh, We had adopted our son when he was four, knowing he had CF, but we knew something about that. We could probably help him out, you know, to make things better. And we're pretty sure that he would have died earlier if we hadn't intervened. Were you concerned about that, having CF yourself and then, you know, cross-contamination and, or did you only see how you could help him? I saw a four-year-old that needed help. My husband and I talked about it. We knew we couldn't have kids and we knew that rather than bringing a child into the world, which could probably have CF, we didn't know because we didn't have Dave tested and not. So we thought, well, you know what, there's one out there. He needs a mom and a dad who at least have a rough idea of what's going on and how it works. We raised Austin the same way I was raised. We never ate off of each other's plates. We never drank out of each other's glass. That was just my brother and I, we never cross-contaminated. And uh, Austin and I never did. And was he up for adoption because of his CF? CF was a big part, but there was a lot of family background there that just, yeah, it was not a good situation for him. He probably wasn't getting the care he needed. No, he wouldn't have, he wasn't getting that there yet. And I mean, he made choices in his life that weren't very good. Uh, his demise in the end was the CF. But we were able to be with him for a little bit before he passed away. And it was very hard. Uh, I needed a few weeks to focus. But as my husband told my son on those final days, because he Austin was really worried that I wasn't going to get through this. And my husband said, son, don't worry. Your mom is one of the strongest people I know. She's going to get through this. And you know what? I came back. I mean, definitely I think of him and my brothers every day. But I know that if we can make a difference 
to make it better for those coming up or behind, then I'm all in. Like when Austin was in the Vancouver hospital, there were carts in his room and they had like a microwave, a mini fridge, you know, a care egg and a kettle. And it just made it more homey, you know, because as you yourself know, you can't always go to the fridge, the patient fridge. So if you could have your extra stuff there, it just made it a lot easier. So that's what has happened since we came back from Saskatoon. Through the help of some friends and stuff, the Kinsmen, two carts were purchased by us and equipped. And two more carts have since been purchased by another CF friend and their family and through the help of one of the stores in the area. And that's wonderful. And that's part of the incredible person you are always thinking about giving back. Now, you are 61 years old and the oldest person living in Saskatchewan, Canada. Yeah, diagnosed since birth because I underwent ball surgery. I had 18 inches of my small intestine removed. So basically my whole first year short, I think 58 days I was in hospital. And Timothy was then diagnosed already. So they kind of had an idea, correct? And they knew what was coming. So they were, they were prepared for him. And he also had the same surgery I had, but his hospital stay was way less than mine. Through all this siblings, I mean, your parents must have so much emotionally to say the least, but having cystic fibrosis and witnessing all this, how did you continue to empower yourself to make change and get through every day yourself with all that was going on to you and around you? I have a very strong faith that God is in control of my life. And he's obviously put me here for something because I was born dead and they brought me back to life. I've always said I'm either stubborn or stupid. I haven't quite figured it out, but I'm still here. Uh, I think it's a combination of a lot of trust in God. And also in the house I was raised, my parents were very strong, hardworking individuals. I mean, dad is 97, mom's 93, and they're still trucking. And was just never raised being able to wallow in it. Mm -hmm. Dad would always say to me and mom that, you know what, there's other people who have to take pills. You just have to take a lot more. There's always somebody worse than you. Right. I mean, I did two weeks at Camp Easter still when I was going through my teenage years. And that was the best thing my parents ever did. Because, you know, having CF, even though you have to do the treatments and stuff, was not as bad as some of these other kids. And these other kids had such a positive outlook on life that it really snapped me into reality. Yes, I have bad days. I mean, everybody does. But I snap out of it. I have friends, family, a very strong support system, and I just try to look for the good in things. And I mean, if I can walk into a store and give someone a compliment, not knowing if they've had a bad day or not, and if it puts a smile on their face and gives them a a good memory, then it's worth it, right? Mm -hmm. And then you yourself feel better for it, right? I, I always try to look for the cup half full rather than half empty. You've seen a lot in your 61 years with cystic fibrosis. A lot has changed. Do you remember what the life expectancy was for you when you were born? Did your parents tell you? Oh, yeah, I knew. I knew if I made it to four, I was doing good. And then I've always been beating the odds, always. I mean, I grew up in the mist tent era. I went camping every night, you know, I got rained on from the mist. But I mean, I got to go camping every night, right? Were enzymes even around? For you when you were little? We used to have, they were called biocase. And mom used to take them and put them between a big soup spoon and crush them. That stuff, it tastes gross when it's crushed. Nothing was in a capsule at the time, right? No, it was not. It was a hard pill. So it had to be crushed. So I got it in my head. You know what? We're just going to swallow these things rather than crushing. So I can take a whole handful, not that I'm proud of it, but I can just, rather than do one at a time, Mm -hmm. I laugh because I'm going, oh my gosh, you can't even get an aspirin down. And here I'm chugging down like maybe 10 to 12 different multivitamins and whatever into me in one shot. Because I figure 
If I do that individually, man, I'm going to be full just on liquid. So no, no, I want to get to the meat of the matter. I want real food. (laughs) When you're in this situation, I know it's the same for my girls too. They're like, we're just taking them all, taking the enzymes, taking whatever other medications they had. And I have an uncle who's a doctor who can't take pills. So that was just a funny little, you know, joke between the girls and him because here they were taking handfuls of pills and he couldn't take one. So yeah, it's just amazing when you're handed something, how you make it work. Little things like, well, how do you, my dad, one time he had a really bad cold and he phoned me up. He said, how do you do it? I said, well, how do you do what dad? How do you breathe? He said, my chest is so congested. How do you do it? I said, I don't know any different dad. Uh, I said, you just do it because that's what you got to do, right? You need air to go in. So you just breathe. Right. And now because of all the hard work that you and Beth and Patty have done to get the CF modulator to Canada, are you able to take that yet? I've been on it since the 28th of October. And how has life changed? Oh my gosh. I didn't realize, Laura, how much effort I was putting in to functioning during the day. I mean, I can take a deep breath and I'm not sounding gurgly. It sounds clear. It's deep. It's not hollow sounding. Uh, My brother said my voice has changed, but it's clearer. There's changes I noticed within the first 24 hours for myself that it's just like, wow. I mean, every day I wake up, I am so thankful for this gene modifier. I mean, I just look at my husband, I go, I am just still, it's such a surreal feeling to know that something that you dream of when you're a kid that you don't think is going to happen in your lifetime happens. Right. Because my parents have been advocating for 61 years. I basically have been advocating for CF for 61 years. And to actually see it, I mean, I never thought I'd be able to get a pension. Well, then I hit 60 and I'm like, oh my God, I can collect my pension if I wanted to. And now I can do stuff like I can go outside, like right now it's starting to become winter here and I can come in and I'm not going into an asthmatic attack from the air change. It's just, it's different. And how in this world of a global pandemic and all the sides that people can take during this pandemic, how do you feel is the the best way to get the word out about science and innovation and promoting policies that support medical breakthroughs and keep drugs and change like this coming? I mean, can people only get it if they have a disease? It's something I think about and I I try to tell people, think outside of your own box because eventually you're going to either have a child with some disease or you're going to know somebody with a chronic illness. Uh, Just with the whole COVID thing itself, it's funny because I'll talk to a few who hate wearing a mask, right? And I'm just like, you know what? There's far worse things than a mask. There's a ventilator. Just little things like I had one person phone me and want to know, well, will this gene modifier work on COPD? And I said, not unless they have the gene variant that you need to have it. And I said, it's different because with us, with CF, the mucus is right around each cell. So you have to break through that mucus barrier in order to get things to work the way they are. And uh, little by little, you know, they see me and they hear me because in our community here, uh, a lot know me. So now when I put those things on Facebook and that, those posts, it really brings awareness that this stuff is out there and it's working. Yes, I realize that it doesn't work for some, but that no one in the CEF world is going to be left behind because we have like the research doctors, the scientists, the drug companies all working together for the betterment of us. And it's all coming. It's all coming together, you know, at a pretty rapid pace, I think. We're only talking for a short time with you. And believe me, I could talk to you for hours. But what is your hope? for the future, for yourself and others with cystic fibrosis? My hope is that no one will be left behind. The families and the advocators still keep pushing till everyone in the CF community can have access to gene modifiers 
or to whatever treatment or even a cure would come. My brother, Tim, would have been right in there Mm. working with this stuff because he loved the science of it. He would have been so into this right now. My hope is that it's like kind of like a pay it forward. If you can find something, well, then pay it forward. If I can give somebody that little bit of hope in whatever area, then I feel I'm paying it forward, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, I might not be the best carpenter, but I might have other skills that will help pay it forward, you know. And I think that is so important. And Emily's entourage here in the States, they're working to help that last 10%. Mm-hmm so that it will help everyone all over the world. They're really doing a lot of work and and so many are, so they will definitely not be forgotten. Anything you want to leave our listeners with? Maybe just to keep a positive attitude and realize you're not alone in the CF battle and there's always somebody out there to help you. And if you don't get your answers, if a door closes one way, go through another door. Just keep pushing on until you get the answers you want. And uh, the payoff is great when it does happen. Delightful to talk to you. Thanks so much, Lorna. You're an inspiration and we really appreciate all your time. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Looking forward to talking to you soon. What a woman she is. Patty, thank you for introducing me to her. Just a wonderful story, and we've only touched the surface. Yes, she's just an amazing human being, and uh, I'm so glad that you have a chance to know her. It was really interesting to hear about her. She's just so positive after everything she's been through and just really carries on. I mean, she has to, but it was just so inspirational to hear her. I think so too. And when we look and we talk about empowerment, which is, I think, what we're kind of having a bit of a series on, which is so important in the CF community, it's what you overcome that gives you that power. And Lorna is such an amazing person. And and to see what she's overcome and been empowered by all of these challenges, you know, when we look at our own challenges, sometimes they seem big until you start looking around and see what other people are facing. And Uh, She's an amazing uh, story of strength and positivity and fortitude. She's incredible. And resilience too, absolutely. Just being able to take what comes her way. I was struck by her being able to pass that along to her son as well. You know, the ability to be resilient in the face of so many challenges. You know, when I was talking with her before we started recording, she even felt uncomfortable at first, maybe with the word empowerment, because it's all how we see each other. This is what she just naturally does. And I think she thought, well, I just have to live on, just keep going. And I think that's very true to the cystic fibrosis community. Would you agree? What really struck me was her parents empowering her and raising her to be this strong person that she is. And I think as moms, we can all recognize that that's a gift that we need to give to our children. CF isn't going away. We may have it controlled. It may be different for everybody, but I think we need to look at our kids and make them strong and let them know how strong they are and how empower them. We can look and empower our children to be able to face what comes their way. And I think Lauren is a prime example of how her parents empowered her. And then she then empowered her son as well. So amazing story. Mm -hmm. What I said to Lorna the other day was a quote from my grandma. She always said, we come from a long line of long livers. And when Lorna told me that her dad is 97 and her mom is 93, I thought, oh my goodness, that's just an amazing testament. And uh, then it got me thinking about ourselves as CF parents and that sometimes we feel as if you know, what our kids are going through uh, takes years off our life in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. And yet it is all about that resilience and perhaps, you know, to look to parents like Lorna's and say, wow, yeah, you are strong and empowering your children has uh, in fact made you stronger too. So hats off. I'm very honored to know them. And I also think empowering them empowers us, right? I think we learn from them. I remember when Emily was doing a little talk in kindergarten 
to her class and she was going around to all the classes as we were educating the elementary school about cystic fibrosis. And I thought, okay, she can talk about enzymes that she takes because that's something a five-year-old can talk about. She understands it, she, you know, to digest her food. And so she went into each classroom and said, I have cystic fibrosis and I'm going to die. And that was... <laughs> That was her, she got everyone's attention, right? And they were like, what, what are you talking about? But we were telling her things age appropriate, but it was still, it empowered her to speak her truth. Like that was on her mind. She was thinking about that. And then she did talk about the enzymes and she showed the kids the enzymes and they were like, wow, really cool. She made it normal. And for Emily, that was always something that we were dealing with was that life expectancy. And that was always something that was on her mind. So we did empower her at a young age to start dealing with that so that she could process it even all these years later, being 24. Such an amazing gift to give our kids is empowerment. And and I think all moms can probably even recognize trying to empower your kids to go to appointments and have different things done, needles, blood work, all those things that can be and are extremely trying to little kids. And I think by um, a way that I worked with Maddie to empower her was to be truthful and explain exactly what she could expect. Mm -hmm. So we had that trust, you know, so when she was getting an IV, we would talk where it's going to be one, two, three, you're going to have a pinch and it's going to end. She knew what to expect. She wasn't traumatized. We had a little game where she used to blow my hair because, you know, the exhale would be like, right? Mm-hmm. So one, two, three, she'd blow my hair. It would be and it would be over. You know, the nurses now be like, wow, she's so good because she was doing it forever. But it was, I think she was empowered by knowledge and by trust in somebody that would say like, it is going to pinch. I'm not going to say it's nothing because it is going to pinch, but it's also going to be over really quick. So important when we're empowering our children is to give, um, you know, educate and, and be truthful. And so they have that understanding and trust in people and your moms, and especially, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And uh, another way that we empowered Devin growing up was from a very young age, um, he decided if he needed to stay home from school. And to my knowledge, he never abused that privilege at all and rarely needed to stay home from school. But it was within his parameters of choice from the time he started school, really. And so we were partners in the decision making around that. And I think it really did help him to take some responsibility for it. Absolutely. They feel like they're in control. And we did that for Molly and Emily as well. A lot with the the blood draws, it was a big help. If the nurse wasn't listening to the countdown, you could say, you know what, I need a different nurse. And we did ask all the doctors, even at six or seven, at all the ages, look directly at my kids. When you're talking to them, it's their disease. Mm -hmm. You know, we're here guiding them, but they need to feel like they're in charge. So that was big early on, but it was the same with the blood draws. Did a countdown. And if a nurse wasn't willing to take it slow or listen to how they wanted the procedure done, I said, you can ask for a different nurse. So at those young ages, they did speak up and say, you know what? I need someone else who's going to listen to me. And we backed them up because it just made them feel like they were in control. And another thing that we did was, we don't do it so much now, but I I still think about it. But one day a year, nobody has CF. We just allowed them one day a year, you don't have to take your enzymes or do your treatments for one day and they could pick the day, but it just seemed to help them mentally. CF, and and we all know this, it has so much control. And the more we give it, the more it takes, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to take back and and give our kids some of the control. And if it's only in little ways here and there, at least it gives them some power, like you said, that everything isn't dictated by a disease that seems to run so much of all of our lives, because certainly 
it's the kids who deal with it. But as moms, it's never ending. And so if an appointment's not working, you know, you say, you know what, that day doesn't work. I'm not going to reschedule something that was really special for my daughter to make an appointment. You know, those are little things that you can kind of take control of again and take a little bit of the power back from the disease, right? And I think uh, when they learn they can do that, it's wonderful as well. Now, I can't say, Patty, you were saying about uh, Devin having, you know, the power to choose days off. It's funny that you said that because literally we went past Maddie's elementary school the other day and she was the absolute worst. (laughs) She used to like, I used to go to the gym every single day and I would drive right by the school and I, my house was right there and she would be like clinging, looking, looking out through the fence as I drove home from the gym. And within five minutes, I would have a call saying, Maddie's not feeling good. And I would go get her because she had so many tummy troubles that I didn't know. Now I know because now she laughs. She's like, oh, mom, I remember I'd see you like going by. And I went, she said it got to the point where the uh, secretary would say, well, Maddie, you know where the phone is. And she was tiny. (laughs) So I didn't have the same luck you did. (laughs) She had me. So I guess I could have whipped up some of that control back from her. But (laughs) well, it's the same as uh, with all of our kids. Uh, You don't necessarily have kids with the same personality you know you have to know your kids personality the other thing that I felt too with Devin was that um, uh, he really responded to peer responsibility and he was blessed with a really wonderful group of friends from kindergarten all the way through they're still pals to this day but they were always part of you know, don't forget, Devin, you need to do this and, you know, make sure and yeah, and I'll wear my hat too. And, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, it really did help, I think, in his case, that he felt like he wasn't alone and that his buddies were essentially cheering him on. And I think we should introduce our kids names and ages again, because it's been a while since the three of us got together. But Molly and Emily, Molly's 26, Emily's 24, both have cystic fibrosis. And then also after you introduce your kids again, tell me what you think about empowering ourselves. We empower our kids so much. Are we empowering ourselves or each other maybe? Well, uh, Maddie, I have one daughter with CF um, and one daughter without, and Maddie will be 20 the end of this month and was diagnosed at eight months old with CF. And that's such an amazing question. Should I answer now or? Patty, why don't you introduce um, Devin and his age again, and then Beth will get started on the answer for us. Sure. Well, I have two sons. Devin is 38. Devin has cystic fibrosis. And Devin's older brother, Brian, is 40. He does not have CF, but he's a carrier. So that's our family. You know, back to your question, empowering ourselves, I think... That's certainly an interesting journey for a lot of us. I know initially I felt powerless. I felt that the doctors knew everything. And although they certainly know a lot, they do not know everything. They don't know our lives. They don't know our children. So learning to get past being afraid to speak your truth and your experiences and expect to be heard was huge for me because I I spent the first year or so just kind of taking everything in until I realized that they needed to listen more and found my voice and said, this is not right. What's happening is not right. My daughter's not getting the treatment that I think she deserves. I think there are better ways and we need to address that, which they did. We had an amazing, like Sick Kids is an amazing hospital and their care is phenomenal. And I certainly don't want to say anything other than that. However, our experience at that time Um, was there were some gaps in care and they needed to be addressed and they needed to be addressed quickly. And they were addressed after I found my voice. And I think that was the beginning was that I do have something to say. I can help make things better. I don't know everything, but I can learn and I can contribute to this process and be a part of a solution for my daughter and, and her journey with cystic fibrosis. So that was just the beginning. Well, my experience was a a little different from yours, Beth, in that the dietitian in the CF clinic when Devin was born. So I already had a voice and I knew my colleagues very well, knew and trusted them 
very much. So my experience was a little different in that regard. But along the way, you do have to uh, identify the gaps and be willing to speak up when it's required. What came to my mind when you asked that question, Laura, was about empowerment now that like Devon is on Trikafta, he's feeling fabulous, he's getting on with his life. And the questions I've been working with for me is like, who am I now? You know, um, there's been a huge piece of me that can step back and look at what else is on the horizon for me as an individual. So that's another part of empowerment that I think is really important. I think that's a great point too, because when our kids are in the pediatric clinic, we are they're everything. We're advocating and doing everything. And I think empowering ourselves to say we have to do this for our child and in turn it will make us feel better because we know that we're helping to improve the care or improve the situation. And then when my girls each took over their insurance, it is a whole new world. We've empowered them their whole lives, little by little, telling them how they're eventually going to have to take over their insurance care. And then you do, and they start taking it over and you've empowered them. And then you do find that you can focus on other things. And we're just talking about in regard to our children, of course, we're all doing many other things, work and all sorts of other things. But with empowering, I feel like it really helps us as moms move forward. And I think both of you empower me with your words and your experience. And I think that's one of the great things about the CF community is we are able to empower each other. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think that having you two and, and, you know, despite this being our second podcast, I think it's been a while in between. We've certainly kept in touch throughout the months and, and touch base and work with each other and develop ideas and that. And I think being able to have this podcast and hopefully empower other moms and perhaps the younger moms that it's a whole new world for them, but still there's a lot of challenges and to have three moms with different perspective and different takes and different countries kind of live some of their experiences and maybe, maybe bits and pieces of what we say here will resonate with a mom and it's going to make their journey with their child a little bit easier. That's really my goal right now. And I've been focusing as Maddie's aged on is, is to try and use what I've learned and what we've been through to empower others, right? Mm -hmm. I, I know back in the day, I didn't have anyone. We didn't have the community online that we have now, which is a huge resource. Like I didn't have that. I was a little overwhelmed going into CF Moms groups back in the day. I found it really uh, scary, quite frankly. I'd, I'd hear things one way or the other, like, oh, my child was never in you know, the hospital at two years old, you know, so I'd be like, Oh, my God, you know, this is so horrible. You know, my child's sicker than everyone else's. And it was scary, or else you'd hear other sides. So I pulled away from that I wanted to help, but I couldn't be that close to everybody else, because I, I found it very hard to do that. So I think this is a lot, um, hopefully can help other people and empower. And that's how I'm using my time now. And along with the rare disease strategy, which is a whole other thing in Canada here. But I found that using what I've learned maybe to help others is a big way to empower myself. I think the point about um, moms empowering each other, we're a wonderful example of that. And I'm really thankful for you guys. I also have the experience of there are a whole lot of wonderful young moms in our circle of advocates in Manitoba. They are such a support to one another. Um, their kids are, you know, similar ages, certainly much, much younger than mine. And for a while, we were setting up, um, you know, the house party app. You could go in there and set up a coffee time and uh, just whoever could pop in for a while would pop in and, and we would just chat. And it didn't get into the, the seriousness that sometimes, uh, you know, some of the online uh, groups do get pretty scary. And I find myself sort of coming in and out of those groups, too, because you can only handle so much of that. But just the positive part about, you know, cheering your kids on when there's the dance recital or there's the ball game or whatever else is part of having a normal life with kids 
I agree. And I was in a virtual mom's retreat uh, about a week ago. And it, it's very interesting to hear from the younger moms because now there is a CF modulator, but the concerns are still the same. The concerns are absolutely the same. So it was important for me to hear what their concerns are, what their fears are. And I did tell them we still have the same fears and concerns. Yes, things have changed, but I remember when non-CF moms, it was usually moms, would say, how are you doing? And I would have one or both of my kids had an exacerbation and they're in the hospital, or I had to go to an event for another and drive an hour, leave the hospital and go. And I would always say, fine, everything's great. (laughs) <laughs> you never wanted to say the truth because I always thought, well, no one really wants to hear it. That would be too much. And then they would avoid me. You know, you just have those thoughts. But if you're talking to a CF mom, they totally get it. You don't even have to explain everything. So I think that's another way that we empower each other. I also think I've learned we can empower our non-CF moms, Right. We can say, actually, I do need some help. Can you drive this kid to this event for me? A lot's going on. You know, it doesn't have to be this overwhelming dump of information of how challenging things are. So I shared that with the moms in the retreat. And I just thought, wow, I've learned a lot. Like we've grown a lot, right? I think that's really important, Laura, because one of the things that I've learned in working in advocacy is that for a very long time, people in the general public didn't know how tough it is to live with CF. And it was because of exactly that. We would say, oh, they're fine. They're doing great. They're, you know, and uh, I understand that. We certainly did it too. But I think it has moved us all along as a society much more that um, people have been willing to get loud about what CF is all about. And we had to in order to be able to get the attention of the decision makers and, and get the medicines that our kids needed. Because they were just like, oh, yeah, well, you look fine. So I think our role as educators also is talk to the non-CF moms in your group and say, yeah, if you're going to the game, would you mind taking my child with you? You know, that's great. And the invisible disease, right? Yeah. Nobody knows how bad it is. We're parents as well. We're not just CF parents and they're not just CF kids, you know? Like any other parent that maybe has two kids in two different sports going two different ways, sometimes we just need help. You don't have to feel like you're playing some card. I think so many of us are, we want to be strong. We got this and we don't want to be seen as, as weak or vulnerable or, oh, help me. Be, you know, I think we avoid that at all costs. However, it doesn't always have to be related to cystic fibrosis diagnosis. It can just be, I'm a mom who's got my hands full or our family with our hands full like any other family that has kids that are busy, we just got one in the hospital (laughs) or one sick, right? So I think we we need to learn that we can still ask for help without feeling like we're playing a sympathy card or something, right? Because, you know, I would gladly help any mom as a CF mom, you know what I mean? Like if someone needed a ride, I was there. If somebody, I was coaching, I was, you know what I mean? And I think it's okay for us to expect that back. You know, and I think that's something we need to, we could pass on to the other moms too. It's like, it's okay, right? Like all moms need help, right? <laughs> whether you've got a CF kid or not, right? Absolutely. So as we wrap up this podcast, I think we all have so much to say and we heard so many wonderful things from Lorna. Beth, moving forward, what are your final thoughts on empowering? Uh, a topic definitely we could talk about for hours. Yeah, I think empowerment is a huge part of owning this journey. And I think listening to Lorna and watching and hearing about Lorna's life and how her parents empowered her as a child has given her the strength and positivity to face all the adversity she has faced in her journey, which is just like a lot for anybody. But to see her where she is now in her life at 61, still kicking butt, still positive, still helping others, despite all the challenges. I said, that's like, 
a true um, calling to what empowerment is. And I think that is a gift that we can all, for me, look on uh, giving our, our own children. We need to be empowered for sure. I can just really echo what you were saying, Beth, because um, Lorna truly is an inspiration and certainly so many other people living with CF. Uh, when we listen to their stories and we hear of the ways that they have overcome, they have uh, empowered themselves and they've been empowered by the caring people around them. We just move forward and we know that uh, we're on the right track and just simply caring for the people around us. And uh, I'm very thankful for the people with CF in my life and uh, appreciate the empowering things that have been happening all around us. And I think everyone addressed it beautifully because it is so important to empower our kids. It gives them strength. It gives them their voice. It gives them advocating for themselves in the hospital or even with the insurance companies or wherever, you know, they need to have their voice. It's been so helpful. And as we said, it's also empowered us and we empower each other. It's just such a powerful tool. It's so important that we just keep talking. So again, great to get together um, in this podcast and talk with the two of you. We We are are the the CF CF Mom Mom Tribe. The music in this podcast is from Mark Cotterill of the UK, an artist who happens to have cystic fibrosis. No information contained in this podcast should be considered medical advice. Medical advice can only come from your CF physician. To learn more about the Bonnell Foundation, check them out online at thebonnellfoundation.org. That's B-O-N-N-E-L-L foundation.org. This podcast was sponsored by Vertex Pharmaceutical, the science of possibility, as well as the Ford Motor Company Fund. Get new episodes of our podcasts as soon as they come out. Follow the Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast in Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Patience tested, waiting for your call.